welcome to Cougars on Cougars another week. I'm Jess. This is Mary. Kind of a rough weekend for BYU fans. Started out great with uh, signing day last Wednesday and then huge one against St. Mary's on Thursday and then a huge letdown on Saturday and we're all kind of feeling it, right? So yeah. we'll get to that in a minute, but first let's get right into talk of the town. Yes, um, we'll start with National Signing Day, which was a high point. It was really impressive what, what Coach Kalani and his staff did with just six weeks. Um, we're not going to go into depth about it because we already know you're up to date on it, but we did um, see a really great picture of Troy and Fred Warner. We are so excited for some Warner Brothers action on the field next season. And then another uh, notable recruit we wanted to mention um, was Keanu Salapaga, Salapaga, David Fiso is going <laughs> to kill me for butchering that name, but um, he's a three-star who flipped from Oregon State, so it's good that our coaching staff has that in him. Uh, a lot of the recruits we obviously aren't going to see right away, but Jonah Trinneman, Troy Warner, Handsome, we are going to see next year, so that yeah. was a good day. Yep, good day. It was good to see a lot of alumni back on campus, too, announcing mm-hmm. a lot of those recruits. Um, So then we get right into Thursday with St. Mary's. Now, if you remember last week, we showed the picture at the very end of the kid that was not flashing the U sign at the elementary Mm -hmm. school. Spencer is his name. And um, he got treated to a very nice day on BYU campus. Um, Got to meet Tom Homo, guys from Sports Nation. Coach Sataki. Yeah, and he just got got to sit front row at the Rock. Mm -hmm. Um, So... We just want to show you a picture of him chatting with Nick Emery, hopefully giving him some pointers Which is on adorable. how to get out of his shooting slump. So That's the guy that <laughs> Coach Kristoviak is scared of, ladies and gentlemen. I know. He didn't look too scary there. Nope. Um, there was also, speaking of little kids, Nate Austin also posted a really adorable throwback this week. Uh, what did he say? He was talking about how he's been dreaming about playing for BYU back when his mom was dressing him. I think he might have been taller than me when his mom was dressing him, okay. but still a really cute kid, so that was a fun post. Cute. Um, sticking with basketball also, Zach Selyus' shorts. We're going to not spend <laughs> as much time as – we could probably do a whole show on this. Those oh, are good. some short shorts. Those are some John Stockton shorts. What do you think about it? Which is hilarious because I never noticed – but I asked Twitter about it. I said, not just why, but how. And someone said to me that it's not a new thing. His shorts have always been that short, but he just usually wears tights. So you don't notice. But <laughs> man, without those tights, you sure notice, don't you? It's his trademark. Woo! I don't know. I like it. <laughs> well, now that the shorts have a Twitter account, at Zach's Shorts, shout out, they can't go anywhere now. I'm here to stay. And I'm sure Zach's not going to change anything. Right. But maybe he'll convert some teammates. He was favoriting all those tweets about his shorts. So um, that's good. He's uh, proud of they it. were lucky against St. Mary's. They were not so lucky against Pacific. So uh, Darn it. we'll have to wait. The jury is still out on the short shorts. It sure is. And we've got one last picture of Tanner modeling trophy this week that he earned from Touchdown Club of Columbus. So check that out. Okay, this is a segment we've been excited to do since before we started the show. Uh, Mean Tweets, which if you haven't seen Jimmy Kimmel's version of Mean Tweets, that's where the inspiration comes from. It's just absolutely hilarious Mm -hmm. because people just say the darndest things on Twitter. Uh, And if you don't know, at DevinD33, he just has this knack for finding people who hate BYU. After every single football (laughs) game, if you go through his timeline, he's just tweeting retweets from people who just, for no reason, sometimes just hate BYU. And it's so funny. We asked Devin to do us a favor and find us some really great tweets of people who hate BYU. And um, we wanted to have some of the fans read them. So anyway, Devin sent us, found us the tweets for this week. Uh, We're going to keep our eyes out for them. But if you see any... Um, tweets from fans who hate us for one reason or another, please send them to us. Let's go Aggies. I hate everything BYU, even if it's competitive chess. At John Helder Comic says, it doesn't matter how far from Provo I am, I still absolutely hate BYU fans. Hashtag you pride. At Tay Condi says, cheaters, period. Cheaters, period. Cheaters, period. Cheaters, period. Hashtag beat BYU. Really, one cheaters wasn't enough? Russ Wilson Country says, you can't fix stupid folks. 
And the fact of the matter is there are a lot of stupid BYU fans on Twitter. Most delusional fan base in sports. Absolutely blows my mind that anyone listens to BYU fans. They are wrong 99% of the time, yet some people hang on their every word. So this is what it's like to be in the 1%. Here's a tweet from the mighty Alaskan Ute. BYU fans and their media are the biggest jock sniffers on planet. They want so bad to feel accepted by BYU players. Weirdos. I guess. So thank you to everyone that participated and sent us their videos. Yes, and it could be you getting asked next time. Yeah. It's time for coaching from the couch. So uh, for St. Mary's, our job was pretty easy. What went wrong in the loss against St. Mary's was that we lost to Pacific. Uh, I mean, <laughs> we thought back on it and we were like, what went wrong? It was fine. It was a pretty complete game. But what went wrong is that we lost to Pacific. So uh, obsolete win against St. Mary's, right? Right, yeah, you can't beat the top team in the conference and then turn around and lose to one of the worst teams. So that's what went wrong. I thought we learned that lesson already, but apparently not. No, um, but for <sighs> heck's sake, what went right against St. Mary's? Had to be defense again. I mean, in the big games that we've won, Gonzaga, St. Mary's, I mean, it, defense has, has kept us in the game and, you know, eventually gotten us the win. I mean, the first very beginning of that game, they were getting easy buckets, easy layups, mm -hmm. and and but we turned things around in the second half, held them to only twenty two points and a half. Really good, really good number, and you could see the guys were locked in and and that they wanted to get that win. Um, just to put this in perspective for you, St. Mary scored twenty two points in the second half of um, that game, and uh, Pacific, the worst free throw shooting team in the country, scored more than twenty two points at the free throw line in the second half of that game. So anyway. Ouch. <laughs> anyway, Pacific, let's just uh, let's have that be the transition into that. So what went wrong against Pacific? What didn't go wrong against Pacific? We had zero mm. bench points. When I saw that stat, I thought it was a joke. I thought it was a misprint. <laughs> it like it. No, it didn't. It felt like it was zero points. It felt like there was <laughs> no one else in there that was making anything happen. I mean, I guess, but Corbin played minutes, Nate played minutes, Z Chapman came in for a little bit, Zach came in, and none of them scored any points. That's just absolutely ridiculous no. is what it is it was miss shot after miss shot from everybody from everybody but uh at least the starters didn't have zero points um so zero bench points really bad can't happen again and also in the second half we made seven shots we were 23 percent shooting how are you gonna win a game when you shoot 23 percent in a half so what else went wrong really um free throws again we talked about it all the Every time, week. and we knew that there was going to be a game where the free throw shooting was was going to hurt us, and we were going to lose. A game? It's been several ga games now where the loss, how much well, we've we lost Well, we didn't have great free throw shooting throws, against yeah. St. Mary's, and we won no. that game. Well, yeah. So I sometimes we could find other ways to get through it, but this game, that could have made a huge difference. I'm still difference. haunted by the Long Beach State game when we lost by one and missed however many. Free throw shooting every week, just assume that that's going to be a problem. Yeah, you can't miss six in a row down the stretch. And nope. help to win a close game. No, one more thing that went wrong, um, and this is from O'Kelly KM, again, for the stat. Everyone on the team, um, I guess starters, since we had zero bench points, scored above average or near their average. Kyle Collinsworth and Zach Sellius were nearly 14 points below their average. So if we were getting points off the bench, that maybe wouldn't have mattered no that much. It. But no one, no one made up for those missed 14 points. Mm -hmm. um, themselves included. So those are several things that went wrong. Sorry, we usually try to stick to just one, but how could we have stuck to just one? So, okay, it was a lot easier to find things that went wrong than things that went right. There were a couple things that went okay. We won't even say that went right. They just went okay. <laughs> yeah, Chase was a bright spot from the line, 14 of 14, 100%, mm -hmm. and we needed those shots. That's huge. But... He found ways to contribute when he wasn't um, – shooting the lights out. I mean, and Kyle Davis had nine more points than average. He was eight for 11. He had 21 points. So that was good. It would have been good if we would have had someone else contributing in the post, um, but good for Kyle Davis. <laughs> good job, Kyle. Okay. So a couple weeks ago, we started a segment called the doctors are in and we prescribed individual players, um, things that will help them in their game. 
And it worked. It did. Well. It did work temporarily. This week, we wanted to try group therapy edition of the Doctors Are In because after Pacific, I think we all need group therapy. <laughs> um, Twitter kind of had a meltdown. And I, I said on my account that the general feeling was somewhat mutinous. People, after another bad loss, how many losses do we have now? Well, total? I, it's like eight losses total, right? And it wasn't just it was a bad loss. It was a, it came right after a huge win against St. Mary's. Again, which that happening twice is just... I can see why people are mutinous. So anyway, there were two um, categories that we broke it down, the Twitter meltdown into. And the first one, we're not really going to spend very much time on because... It's ridiculous. It's Well, and it's, <laughs> it's, garbage. it's touchy and it runs deep and whatever. <laughs> coach Rose, not just Coach Rose, but just the whole coaching staff in general, is it a coaching issue that they don't care about, defense that... I don't even know what people are saying. Hashtag fire Rose. We don't like that crowd. We don't really want to give them the time of day. I think that Coach Rose is a really consistent coach. He has a winning record to show it. We're not blaming him. So yeah, next, what was it. the next area we saw? A lot of people talking about the leadership of our seniors, of our captains, particularly Chase and Kyle, who mm-hmm. are on the floor a lot. Mm-hmm. And for me, I don't think that's an issue. We have different opinions on this. Yeah. And we, and we had quite an interesting Twitter conversation about it. And I think that you did forget to mention Nate Austin, but people aren't mentioning him as much. And it's funny because he's less – I think it's fair to say he's less talented, but he's more vocal and more energetic. And that's what I think that people aren't seeing necessarily from Chase and Kyle and are disappointed in. On the court. Especially – yeah, on the court. And especially against Pacific. So you do have some stats to back you up. What I will say that I think that Chase and Kyle are both amazingly talented (laughs) players, and I'm so glad that they're on our team, but I feel like they're more individually driven and focused than they are on the rest of the team. Like with Kyle, I feel like he's really good at bringing the best out in himself, and I I like that he shares the ball. He does have the all-time assist record, but I don't know how good he is at bringing out the best in his teammates, which is something that I want to see from a senior captain. And I mean no disrespect to him because I love him. He's an incredible athlete, but is he the vocal leader that I want him to be? No. Well, and I want to know, what is it that he's not bringing out in his teammates? I mean, he can only go so far to get his teammates to put the ball in the basket. You're, You're right. And I mean, maybe I'm asking him to walk on water. But maybe <laughs> it's I, I guess maybe it's easier for me to ask Kyle to walk on water than it is for me to ask Nick Emery to walk on water. Right. Well, I don't know. I particularly take issue with people who are saying that Kyle didn't do his best in that Pacific game. I mean, I went back and watched it and particularly just paid attention to Kyle. And during that whole game, I mean, I you see him being so active. He's mm-hmm. getting steals. He's forcing turnovers. You know, he's driving to the rim and getting fouled. He's trying to create these big moments that are going to get his teammates fired up. And that's what he's done in the past. You know, there's usually some moments during the game where something happens. It's a dunk and a steal or it's a great pass or whatever. And that's what gets everybody fired up. In this game, he tried. I mean, he I I went back and counted and I only got to about 10 minutes left in the game. How many times Kyle passed to a wide open teammate, either right at the rim or wide open at the three point line? trying to create a spark, and none of them went down. I mean... Yeah. he had four assists, and if he, if he's passing as much as you say he is, that's partially on the other guys for the shots not falling. Yeah, I think that was the issue there. It was the poor shooting, and it, it was spread out among everybody. There was no one on the team that had a great shooting night other than Kyle Davis. I think people maybe aren't giving Kyle as much credit as they should, but I still stand by what I said. And I don't know, and I'm, I'm not going to say that anyone is not trying because we... I think it's um, BS to say that we can gauge their effort. We don't know. Everyone shows it differently. But how do you lose that game against Pacific? Poor shooting and not making free throws down the stretch. I just think <laughs> I just think lose. that everyone is at the point where they think that it's more than that, and they're trying to figure out what that more is. And I wish we had an answer for you. We're, we're trying to tell you that it's not Coach Rose and that it's not necessarily as much of the senior leadership as you think it is. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what it is. Yeah, I think it's a combination of a lot of things, and that's why I think people are, are racking their brains and um, scratching their heads because you can't just pin it on one thing. It's not one thing. It's 
a million things. It's inexperience. Maybe it is a little bit of the senior leadership, but not 100% the senior leadership. It's zero bench points. It's it's inconsistency. That's what it is. <laughs> we figured it out, but we don't have a prescription besides for be consistent, which is not really super helpful. So, Well, we've got a late quote of the week that comes from John Wooden, and he said that nothing will work unless you do. So that's my prescription for this team. So this week we talked to former BYU player Jonathan Tavernari, who played at BYU from 2006 to 2010, and he was a Mountain West Conference Sixth Man of the Year that um, his senior season in 2010. And we talked to him before the Pacific game, so a lot of what you'll hear was before that game even happened, and a lot of what he said turned out to be sort of prophetic. Yeah. He's joining us all the way from Italy, so we're really excited to have him on. Jess, you got our first question for him. JT, where are you and what are you doing? Um, I am, I am I'm playing in a city called Agropoli. It's about an hour away or so from Naples. Um, it's right on the, by the Amalfi Coast. Mm. There's a really famous island called Capri. Yeah. Over here by us. Um, <clears throat> right now I'm on the road. I'm about an hour away from Rome. And um, we've got a game tomorrow. And, you know, season's going well. And, you know, I'm helping the team. And we're in third place. So, you know, things are going good. So, BYU, our basketball team. Um, we have had our ups and downs, for sure. Uh, I think that there are kind of a lot of departments that we're kind of struggling in. So we wanted to ask you one area you think needs the most improvement. I think we don't have guys that kind of live and die by a win anymore, you know. And I think that is the main problem. I said that on Twitter the other day, and I told that to Ben Criddle. Um, like, every time we lost, and I was talking to Lee about this, every loss, we, we, I think we had my entire career, I think I had three bad losses, you know? I never lost to a low, I never lost to, like, a Pepperdine. You know, when we didn't get ranked in the top 20, when we didn't at least win the conference championship, at least didn't go to the, to the tournament, uh, to the conference tournament finals, and when we didn't get to the, to the NCAA, tournament those were considered for us down years yeah. and so and i feel like ever since then rotations haven't been really set because if you go back to my time and you know even when i when i when i gave up my starting spot for noah we knew that if the starting five wasn't cutting it i was going to be able to come in and take care of the take care of this business brandon davis was going to help chris myers was going to help lamar was going to step up mike lloyd was going to help but now it's like you don't know who's going to come in and help. Let's talk to me about Corbin a little bit, what you think he needs to do better and how he can continue to get better. Well, it's interesting because when he, when he got back from his mission and he had been home for not even a month, he was playing with us and he was dunking. And, and he was beating and, you know, doing things on the post um, against Brandon Davies. And Brandon is playing the NBA and, yeah. you know, Corbin just got back from Korea. Where, but I feel like he hasn't really developed. Like, for instance, if I tell you, think about Trent placed it, and one move Trent placed it did on the post. And you say, well, Trent used to really do a, a little baby hook shot with his left hand really well. And then I say, hey, um, give me a move that Noah Hartsock used to do really well. And he said, well, Noah had a really good 15 footer. And so if I start bringing out, you know, bringing some big man from BYU basketball, you can at least pick one thing that we could pull the ball on a post and we could play to that. Um, I asked you guys a question. What is Corbin Capucci's go-to move on a post? But, I mean, I, I refuse to believe that nobody has really taken the time to be like, okay, we're going to focus on getting you one move on a right block and another move on a left block so you can do something. Yeah. Okay. Even if it is a turnaround, a face-up jumper, or something like that. Because right now, Corbin only scores if he's banging, 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 get a smaller kid. Yeah. Or offensive reach. Yeah. Or when it's penetrating, and, you know, kind of dishes to him. So, and I feel like if Corbin was really developing, like, you know, like, a, like, like somebody that wants to get paid for a living playing basketball, BYU would be in a much better position than it is right now. because After our loss to Pepperdine a couple weeks ago, you tweeted this. You said, hard to say it's okay. Pepperdine is a solid team. They deserve the W. Maybe next game. 
Why? Because that's not what Dave Rose is all about. So, JT, what is Coach Rose all about, especially after a bad loss like that? So, throughout my career, I had three bad losses. You know why? Because we understood that you don't you don't lose games that you're supposed to win. There were times that Coach Rose came in the locker room and said, we were bad guys. All we got to do is just play hard. And when we came in the halftime and we were playing soft, he said, you guys are soft. JT, you want to play basketball and make money out of this? Nah, uh you better go to school. You better get good grades. <laughs> Lee, Trent, that guy kicked your butt last year. He's kicking your butt against this year. So, and his attitude hasn't changed. But the way we responded to it changed. How can you have three bad losses in a season when I had three bad losses? of my career, you know, so that's my point, like, these, some of these things are unacceptable, okay, until Pepperdine goes to the NCAA tournament or <laughs> do something amazing, it's a bad I loss, Pepperdine is a bad loss, Best of, I, lost, I lost to Portland is a bad loss, you can't, you can't go and tease us and show us that we can beat Gonzaga, at Gonzaga, and then not travel to Portland and stay in Gonzaga, you know, and that's what blows my mind. That's what really bothers me. Yeah. Out of you, Nick Emery, and Matt Carlino, who is the bigger gunner? Oh, me by a mile. But the, but the difference is, I say me because, and, and you know, actually, I'll take that back. It probably probably Matt because he had the ball in his hands a lot, you know, so he could come in and pull up right away. Um, I always shot when I got a pass, so. In, in a sense, I'm probably the biggest gunner because I shot everything that came my way. I never saw a shot that I didn't like. I don't see a shot that I don't like. And as soon as I cross half court, I'm within my range. Good stuff, JT. Thanks for joining us. Is there anything that you'd like to say to Cougar Nation? Um, I love BYU. BYU pretty much made me the man I am today. I, you know, I'm, I'm very proud. I'm not, you know, I'm not prideful, but I'm very proud of of the legacy that I left behind, um, you know, I was able to be a part of back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back championships. My team is in the top 25 all, all four years. I went to the tournament all four years. BYU was never a bubble team, a re-in or out team. We were always a lock. We just had to defend where we're going to fall and we're going to play. We created a winning, we created a winning uh, culture there, you know. So I think my, my frustration with the team sometimes comes from the fact that we lose left a baby there that, you know, it, when we played BYU, you had to respect it. You know, it wasn't just, you know, for you know, the Dukes and Lake Forest and North Carolina, it wasn't something that people were just going to come in and just run us off the court. You know, they're going to have to earn that, that respect. Appreciate it. Thank you. Remember to say your prayers and read your scriptures at night. Hope you enjoyed that interview. We're sorry about the shoddy internet connection. You can only expect so much from Italian hotels, right? <laughs> uh, this week, what? this week's episode was uh, sponsored by Coach Kristobiak's technical foul in their game against Oregon Sunday. You keep protecting yourself from you, Coach Kristobiak. Also brought to you by teams that start with the letter P, as in, please go away. <laughs> May you always stay loyal to the white and blue. For Jess, I'm Mary. We'll see you next week.